Good evening, everybody. I welcome you to this International Eco-Socialist Conference on, in a digital form. I'm pleased having the possibility to present you some ideas for, for further discussion. Uh, presenting seven theses on the challenges for an eco-socialist strategy. I would like to encourage our joint uh, discussion on this conference and uh, in the following uh, time. First, we are experiencing a comprehensive crisis of the capitalist mode of production and domination. We are in an important moment of the history of our societies. The global economic crisis will plunge millions of people into misery. The healthcare crisis in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic has already killed half a million of people and is putting lives of further hundreds of thousands or even billions of people at risk. All this is taking place in the context of global warming which is the result of the fossil capitalist mode of production. The global economic crisis will be deeper than any crisis since the early 30s. The economies of most countries in Europe are expected to shrink more than 7% this year. The unemployment rate will rise up to 20 or even more percent uh, in many countries. The destruction of the environment, the disregard of the planetary boundaries, the global warming, the overaccumulation and overproduction, unemployment, mass misery and healthcare crisis are ultimately the expression of a comprehensive crisis of this capitalist mode of production. Capital itself is facing a fundamental challenge. Will it be possible? to shift the costs of the crisis to the workers and the poor in order to improve the conditions for exploitation of capital, valorization of capital to such an extent that large-scale investments will be worthwhile again. Capital will only achieve these goals if it succeeds in increasing profit rates and at the same time expanding its sales on markets. But this is like squaring a circle. The state supports profitable companies with historical, unique financial amounts. Lufthansa alone is to be supported by the German as well state as well as Austria, Switzerland and Belgium with around 11 billion euros. The governments thus are underlining that they are simply ignoring the urgency of the climate heating. They do not want to get out of the fossil-based industry, but on the contrary, to continue to feed it with tax money. The current support packages are a tantamount to a gigantic privatization of public funds. I come to the second thesis. Capital and its representatives face a dilemma. On the one hand, they support companies with massive state money, at the same time, they have to solve the problem of massive overaccumulation. But this would amount to a massive devaluation and destruction of capital, which in turn would lead to an even greater unemployment and political uncertainty. At the same time, companies face the problem of opening up new markets for new products and technologies. These goals cannot be pursued simultaneously. The capitalist elites are in a real leadership crisis. This is particularly striking at present in the US, where a misguided president no longer is in a position even to promote a reasonably coherent program for capital itself. The European Union is facing huge problems and must ensure that the centrifugal tendencies do not get out of hand. The EU Commission is now pressing ahead with the project of a European Green Deal. This project remains trapped in the contradictions mentioned. On the one hand, the EU wants to push the most powerful capital groups into the most globally competitive supplies of so-called green technologies. For this purpose, companies need massive state support. On the other hand, the EU and the states want to avoid capital devaluation as far as possible and only slowly want to leave the fossil development path and finally they want to pass on the costs of the crisis to the general population.
population. So fourth, I, at this point, I will briefly explain what I understand by eco-socialism. The goal of limiting warming, global warming to 1.5 degrees compared to the pre-industrial era requires a historically unique conversion and even dismantling of large parts of the entire productive apparatus of our societies. We need a society that produces less and differently, transports less, makes decisions together, cares for people and nature, and shares the entire wealth and democratically makes decisions together. This means that we have to question the capitalist mode of production, not only theoretically and abstractly, but we very concretely in our everyday demands. This means that in a process of self-empowerment, the exploited and oppressed successfully challenge the end, the successfully challenge and end the economic and political power of the capitalist class. An eco-socialist transformation of society aims at the democratic social appropriation of production, the transport in infrastructure and the massive expansion of social infrastructure, which should be largely free of charge. Only in this way we can organize a society democratically, socially just and ecologically sustainable. The central goal of an eco-socialist alternative is the fair sharing of the socially necessary working time, namely the paid and the unpaid working time. The eco-socialist perspective explores possibilities of a solidarity, way of life and a comprehensive social emancipation. So the fifth point, the political challenge consists is to develop demands and perspectives which, taking into account the ecological restrictions, tie in with concrete social feminist and ecological concerns of large sections of the working class and with current struggles. These demands and perspectives are to be fused together in an eco-socialist transitional program so that the dynamics of their realization finally breaks the framework of the existing logic of competition and profit, but respecting the restrictions imposed by nature. An alternative orientation consists in the democratic social appropriation of the most important resources and means of strategic means of production. <coughs> I use the term social appropriation in a threefold sense of a method, a political strategy and a real practice. There are starting points in most everyday concrete struggles. The central idea is always to promote the self-activity of affected people. This method and practice of social appropriation is intended to contribute to a process of reconstruction, a diverse movement of workers in all their diversity. We want to develop demands that begin as reforms and at the same time have an inherent logic that contradicts the logic of capital accumulation. Six, we have to convert and dismantle industries. Large parts of the productive apparatus, but also the circulation and consumption of reproduction and reproduction must be converted in such a way that they meet ecological requirements. Certain industries, such as the armaments industry, and large parts of the meat processing industry must be massively dismantled and eventually dis uh, replaced. The dismantling and conversion of industry requires planning. Only with social planning can this extensive process be designed in such a way that it does not lead to high unemployment as well as the marginalization and misery of large parts of the population. Even the social appropriation of strategic mean, means of production only makes sense in conjunction with democratic planning. By social planning, I mean an open process and a public debate about possible desirable conditions and the measures to be taken to achieve these objectives. 
These processes require that workers and citizens in democratically elected structures work out alternative scenarios and options and confront them in a social and democratic debate. They must actively shape and decide these processes themselves. These alternative options must be determined in a democratic decision-making process. However, this also requires new institutions. The struggle for decarbonization of society must be linked to the constitution of a new pluralistic movement of workers in a broad sense of the word. This process of reassembling and reforming a movement of organized communities of the working class can only succeed if new approaches and impulses from the women's movement, uh, the environmental movement and other social movements are mutually enriching. In order to promote such an orientation, the formation of an eco-socialist movement is necessary. This also requires plural, a pluralistic or pluralistic eco-socialist organizations in order to collectively process past experiences, learn from movements around the world, process scientific findings in the elaboration of political and social alternatives, and intervene tactically and strategically in everyday political struggles. So I come to my last point. How do, do we have to intervene? I think that the international climate justice movement should agree on some joint campaigns in the immediate future. To this end, we should start a dialogue with trade unions and progressive social movements. In these campaigns, climate protection, protection of health and the interest of workers for a decent and meaningful jobs must find a common expression. First, I propose an international campaign for the widespread abolition of the meat processing industry. This is an important step towards the conversion of the entire agricultural and food industry and the development of an organic farming and food industry. Second, I propose an international campaign for the social appropriation of all airlines. The socialization of the airlines will make it possible to radically dismantle them and eventually integrate them into the public railway system. These new publicly controlled companies have the task of operating a socially just and ecologically sustainable mobility and transport system at national, continental and intercontinental level. Third, I propose an international campaign for the social appropriation of the automotive industry and its radical conversion into an industry that produces socially useful and environmentally friendly products. We do not want to save this harmful industry. We do not want to promote electric cars. We rather want to radically convert and reduce it. We want to work with the trade unions to find out ways of converting this industry so that the workers can keep their jobs and use their creativity to develop new tra public transport products and services and a sustainable uh, mobility. Just recently, I published this book, Revolution for the Climate. If you can read German, probably you find some further ideas I just have presented right now. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm pleased having uh, two, inter three interesting days of debate and shared learning However, it's only in a digital form. I hope soon we will can meet together physically. Thank you very much. Good evening, comrades. I'm Sherry Wolf. I'm speaking to you from my home in Brooklyn, New York City, in the United States, on Monday, June 15th, 2020, exactly two weeks to the day since the murder by police of George Floyd. I've been asked to speak a bit about what's happening in the United States. Well, it's going to be hard to sum up. I'll leave it to the poets and the playwrights to describe more eloquently what these last three months of our global pandemic, depression, and now upheaval are like. But to me, a revolutionary socialist living in the epicenter of the U.S. disaster in New York City, the health and social and economic devastation brought about by COVID has revealed that the underlying condition 
the real virus killing all of us and our planet is capitalism. Capitalism is the virus that brought about unplanned hyper-industrialization, that brought humans and wild species into close contact in urban spaces. Capitalism is the virus that has caused created death trap warehouses and meatpacking plants where low-wage, mostly immigrant workers die in huge numbers to this day. Capitalism is the virus that has spent hundreds of years developing and perfecting systems of brutal racial inequality and segregation, especially against black people. And capitalism is the virus driving haphazard urbanization all over the world, forcing inhumane, overcrowded conditions, placing the poorest people and the unhoused on the front lines of those who die. It is the ultimate capitalist math. Those who will last in life will be first in death. I want to make a few points about what's happening here in the States. My first is that we are in the middle of the most powerful upsurge of rebellion since the 1960s, with the potential of far greater intensity, involvement, and radicalization than even those rebellions. Why? because it is so much more volatile today than 1968. Our world is more treacherous. It's about time that we had this level of upheaval. Nobody knows where it's headed, but it, I don't believe, is not going to end soon. Just yesterday in Brooklyn, 15,000 marched through the streets demanding transgender lives matter. In Atlanta on the same day, within 24 hours of another police officer killing another black man, this one unarmed, sleeping in his car outside of a burger joint. The police chief was forced to resign, and the cop who killed him was immediately fired. We have not seen that kind of swift action. It is not justice, but that is the kind of action we've not seen before in this country. This coming Friday, the West Coast dock workers are shutting down the ports up and down the coast in celebration of Juneteenth, the 19th of June, which is the commemoration of the abolition of slavery in the United States, and it will also commemorate George Floyd. Again, a political strike, leading other unions to take political strike action as well on Friday. A tremendous force has been unleashed by demonstrators who face off against the police in hundreds of U.S. cities and towns. It is a rebellion against the legacy of enslavement, against the ubiquitous mass incarceration system that brutalizes and cages black people. The whole history of this country is a gruesome story of violence against black and brown people. And every major rebellion in this country was sparked by and flowed through the black liberation struggle. It is no surprise that this one is too. The double crises of global pandemic and economic collapse needed only a spark to burst out into open rebellion. George Floyd, the killing of George Floyd, was that spark. The second point is that racism is at the core of this uprising, but it's also about the chaos of capitalism in crisis. The absolute callousness of elected officials, and I'm talking not just about Trump's Republican Party, but also about the so-called opposition Democratic Party, who run every major city in the United States, almost every, New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Chicago, Minneapolis, Baltimore, Washington, D.C., all of these cities are run by Democrats. They have failed just as the Republican Party and Trump. You cannot send millions of essential black and brown workers out to their deaths every day in a global pandemic, as they have all done, offer no support, no health care, no protections, and then continue to brutalize and murder them. Weeks before the killing of George Floyd, we were already seeing wildcat, which is to say illegal strikes, workers without unions just walking off the job to demand hazard pay, masks, paid sick leave, and they were winning. These strikes and actions were often led by black and brown people, disproportionately women. 
The third point I want to make is that Trump and the far right are stoking the crisis on every level. Their profits are threatened, and thus the push to reopen the country while death figures and, and illness are still on the rise is coming from them, this death cult. The fact that Trump would even use the military brass to clear peaceful protesters from outside of the White House so that he could take a photo op with a Bible in front of a church and he mowed people down, beat them down, has now created a backlash. But it is also a backlash from our side, but it is also stoking support from his radical white supremacist base. The far right, there are far right people in the streets in this country for the first time, in cities with bats going about beating black people. You have uh, white supremacists, whether they're members of the KKK or some other organization, getting into their cars and their trucks and driving them straight into protesters. You have, just like what we saw in Charlottesville in 2017, and of course, we see militarized police who themselves have their origins, and many of them still are, part and parcel of white supremacist organizations coming in like an occupying power into black and Latino neighborhoods in this country. Make no mistake, the far right is organizing in the United States. And while I am among those socialists who do not throw around the word fascist to describe Trump very easily, I will say that these are precisely the circumstances in which he is having to rely on a far-right base more and more. Trump is surely an autocrat with the makings of a fascist following. The ruling class in this country is scared and their system is teetering, and the masses are rising against them, the very circumstances that can breed a fascist backlash. And of course, this is a nation with 45% of the population own weapons. The pages of the business press are filled with fearful warnings about revolution, rebellion, food riots, mass rent strikes. Well, they're right to be scared. There will be food riots. There are rent strikes, and they will become more massive as the weeks and months wear on. There will have to be, because the United States allows for no other solution than violence right now. Though I believe we are far from revolution, we have certainly reached a point where the majority oppose the status quo and huge majority support people who are protesting, at least those who are protesting peacefully. Large debates. Another point I want to make is that this upheaval has done more in two weeks for working class confidence, combativity, and self-assertion than years of permitted marches. The last two years has seen the U.S. labor movement begin to move and even hold successful strikes in education and health care. But these last two weeks have been an escalate, have escalated all of that. The labor movement in Minneapolis with the teachers in the lead immediately pushed to get the cops out of the schools. Same with the professors at the university in that state. You've got transit workers in Minneapolis, New York, and Chicago refusing, refusing to transport protesters to jail for the police at these protests, effectively declaring a political strike. Millions of people are donating to bail funds to release jailed activists. This is not going to end. People are seeking ways to show solidarity and to push back like never before. And multiracial crowds hit the streets every single day. It's summertime. There are no jobs. The weather is lovely. And the rebellion is reconnecting a generation to each other and to our own humanity. It's a beautiful thing to watch. And to the best of my ability as a 55-year-old in a pandemic to participate in as well. Demands to fund the police and abolish the police and prisons Always far left demands, the kinds of things that we would write about in our newspapers and journals, but never utter aloud at a protest, are now center in the debate on television and in corporate newspapers and in the media online. These discussions are everywhere and they're not going away. And finally, I'll say that nobody, nobody 
is coming to save us, but us. We are past 20% unemployment in the United States that will not snap back anytime soon. We are looking at mass unemployment on top of an ecological crisis, on top of an, an, an economic devastation, on top of a health nightmare in a country with no public health, with, without public health being accessible to millions and millions, tens of millions of working class people. I don't know where this is going. We are clearly in uncharted waters. But the struggle is elevating people's politics, is forcing a level of debate, discussion, and frankly, organization that I've not ever seen in my life. I hope that this weekend's debates and discussions in Switzerland will help us begin to knit together some of our insights, some of the lessons that we're beginning to learn even in these early months of what I believe are transformative times. There is no going back to what was before COVID. Everything is going to have to change here. Whether it will change for the better or whether things will move backwards. And we may well go through periods in which we will see ups and downs for some time to come because there is no decisive class struggle, decisive leadership that could offer that solution yet. I believe that something has popped off, that things are going to be much, much different from here on out. And I hope for the better. And I think we on the organized left have a lot to contribute in these struggles and frankly, a great deal to learn. Many of us never would have predicted this level of combativity, this degree of radicalization. But here we are. Here we are. It's happening. It's now. It's happening now. Even here in the heart of the empire, which is going down and it's going to be torn down by its own people, its own population, opposes its own empire. Olá, eu, meu nome é Valmor, Valmor Guedes. Eu trabalho aqui num grupo hospitalar no Brasil, em Porto Alegre. É o grupo hospitalar Conceição. Né? O nosso grupo ele é formado por um complexo aí de quatro hospitais e também por uma rede de atendimento à saúde básica da população, distribuído em postos de saúde dentro das vilas da cidade e também uma unidade de tratamento de atendimento emergencial, que chamamos de UPA, aqui na Zona Norte. Isso tudo engloba em torno de 10 mil trabalhadores né, das mais diversas necessidades profissionais né, dentro do atendimento à saúde da população. Este hospital, esse grupo de trabalho, trabalha, ele é vinculado ao governo federal, uma empresa pública, na, e atendimento dentro do sistema de saúde do país, que é o sistema unificado, sistema único de saúde, que chamamos aqui de SUS, e atende gratuitamente a população, integralmente e gratuitamente, nas mais diversas especialidades, desde a atenção básica até a alta complexidade. Então, aqui em Porto Alegre é uma grande referência, mas é uma referência também para todo o estado do Rio Grande do Sul, e um dos maiores complexos aí do, do país também. Aqui nós temos, com um grupo tão grande de trabalhadores, temos uma associação, a Associação dos Trabalhadores Local, e de onde eu sou um dos membros da diretoria eleita, né? faço parte aqui da diretoria, atendendo os colegas das mais, das mais diversas necessidades, e também faço parte do Sindicato de Trabalhadores da Saúde, aqui no nosso estado, Rio Grande do Sul, que representa também é, outros trabalhadores de outros hospitais, tanto da rede pública quanto da rede privada. Então, we are going through very difficult situations through the uh, in this pandemic as an entity of struggle. We fight for better work conditions, and this has been 
what we've been doing. Now this need is even stronger and it's more difficult due to what we are going through. We, from our total manpower, we have 10% is in health leave due to several needs, uh, including coronavirus infection and also due to other diseases. And one of the aspects is due to the emotional burden and also mental health issues uh, due to very, very violent stress. And it is a, in high number, which makes the internal service more difficult. We have been trying to receive uh, uh, more people to work with us, uh, being allowed by our board. We have an overload uh, on the workers uh, due to the infection rate being increasingly higher. So we have uh, colleagues who are infected by COVID, several of them are under treatment, over 100 are at home, and we have even lost two colleagues two nurses and who were unable to resist. For us workers, this is very strong. It is uh, not just happening here, but in all countries where health workers are at the front line and of course they are more exposed to the infection. It is very hurtful to lose uh, one of our colleagues who is like a family member whom we are with in our daily lives. All health workers, among the health workers who, who, whom we lost, we count about 100. And this is happening throughout the world. It is not easy. We are discussing with the company in trying to receive enough and in good quality protection devices for our workers. The company has not tested all the workers, so it is possible that among us we even find asymptomatic workers who are spreading the virus, the one we are just trying to, exactly trying to fight. So the lack of sensitivity from the board has left us even more concerned. The difficulty in obtaining the protection devices, we have uh, risk groups. Out of these 10,000 health workers, we have a high number which is in the risk group due to age or some chronic mor comorbidity. And we have not received any special attention from the board of the company. So our struggle is hard. We have a daily fight for these reasons. We are even making appeals for street protests, which is not something that's recommendable currently, but we even appealed for this uh, in making manifestations in front of the companies. We even have some workers who feel the need for making a stronger pressure because we might have even more colleagues in this situation. In Rio Grande do Sul, we have these two deaths. And in our group, which we call GHC, it is the hospital and the place where we have the most infected people among health workers. So, and we are we are in a very contradictory situation in our country, many among our colleagues. Since we have a great majority who has voted and was supportive of this government, health workers supported the candidate who explicitly supported violence. 
he ended up being elected, we can feature him as a very negating government. It is broadly publicized in the media. The way the president deals with the pandemic, the, trying to demonstrate that the statistic and scientific data are not valid, and and dealing with the situation within a political dispute. It is an extremely racist government. As an example, it named uh, for the Palmares Foundation to deal with uh, racial issues and to combat uh, racial inequalities in the country. A person who defends and tries to justify the horrors of uh, slavery. And it is a very violent government as well, fostering violence and fake news. Also defends clearly the arming of the population. He himself is very coherent uh, throughout his uh, trajectory in politics, has always been very violent in his speeches which uh, fostered uh, violence always. The government allied to local bourgeoisie is uh, for extreme liberalism with a strong incentive to privatizations. The, f the economic team defends the total exemption of the state in the market leaving a permanent minimal state, also wishing to get rid of uh, the state-owned company, not being interested in the service rendering. The inequality that was big is worsening because of the concentration of wealth. Some aspects of the crisis, the sanitary crisis we are undergoing in this pandemic, which is a worldwide crisis, it is also an economic, social and political crisis. In this crisis, in the economic crisis generated as a, as a worldwide context, the uncertainty of the investors is very noticeable. So this has reinforced the crisis and the policies that the government has put forth through decrees, amendments to the Constitution, which take away rights from the workers and bring about a, a high, very high number of uh, people without any support generating an uncertain future and a social crisis due to unemployment which is fostered by the governmental policies. Inequality that is very strong. We have over 40 million Brazilians who have no guarantee of uh, working conditions. They are uh, unemployed and uh, working in very far away places in the country, contrary to what the country was developing and getting back to that former situation of misery and hunger. And due to how the executive, the President of the Republic, is acting, which is also fostering the power struggle, making in, uh, access to information difficult, in, uh, fostering fake news, and fascist groups also. This has led to a very strong political crisis. The state has worked not as a pacifier, but incentive for conflicts and leading the population to a situation of social collapse. In the words of the president himself, when he was a Congress member, he defended civil war. And 
arming the population. One of the features is uh, his closeness to the military police, to the armed forces. The policeman is uh, has access to arm and he really fosters the rage against social movements and having several key ministries with generals as their heads. Currently, we estimate 12% of unemployed in the country, it is a very high number, 38 million, 40 million informal workers, among which almost 14 million in, uh, in extreme poverty. These data stimulate a very strong crisis in our country. We must work on in uh, in midst of a sanitary crisis due to coronavirus and with all within all this context is very challenging we for worker associations uh, and worker unions but this is something a work that has to be done we have a SUS which is unique health system was born through was made official in the constitution of 1988. It was born from the movement of sanitarists and activists who were able to approve the, in 1986 the proposal to create this system. This system has a feature of very strong democracy in order to promote, protect, and recover the health of the population. With these objectives, its principle is the universality of access, even for immigrants who do not have their documents can have access to this health system, and also having an, uh, a whole treatment from the first symptoms until high complexity hospital treatments. So it has a very strong democratic aspect, it is a decentralized system with uh, councils, municipal, stately and governmental councils. It has workers, entities and it is a system that is financed by the taxes so it is a public system. With the advent of a more right-wing government in 2016 it was Approve, a, a, an amendment to the Constitution was approved in which freezes the spendings and investments of the state and it, it did not separate spendings for health. So for a system that has its difficulties with restricted investments due to lack of involvement of the government, this amendment worse in the situation. The pandemic really caught our system with all these problems and exposed all these difficulties and the deficiency in the financing also. But even with all these deficiencies, the service to the population here in the country has been through this unique system which shows the importance of the public system which guarantees the access of any person and guarantees that the state invests in research to discover uh, the cure of vaccine compared to the, a private system. If it was like this, the population wouldn't be able to pay for it. Like in the U.S., uh, where, uh, uh, where the population does not have access to millions of dollars of spendings, the A class has access of to the private service, but the big mass of the population doesn't. 
So if we do not have the public structures, if we didn't have them, our crisis would have would be much worse. We still are in a, in a situation of uh, of uh, increase in the infection rates, but if we did not have this unique health system, we would have a generalized chaos and many, many more lives would have been lost. So this has to be a fight among workers and citizens so that health is treated like a universal good and um, it is uh, uh, the right of every citizen and has to be serviced by a by the public system. I want to thank for the opportunity of being part of this panel exposing the situation of our country, Brazil, and hoping that out of this panel we can reach proposals in terms of worldwide unification of movements, actions that unite our fight and can bring about unified activities so that we can take steps forward we must give the example, we as workers must give the example and get united. Dear comrades, thank you for inviting me to this International Eco-Socialist Conference. I bring you greetings from my organization, Italy, the Anti-Capitalist Left, as well. As many of you know, Italy is one of the countries which is most hard hit by the pandemic for its spread around the world. Indeed, at the start, it was the country most affected. Um, and the virus hit the northern regions in Lombardy with particular force. This was a region which is home to the most industry in the country. I must say that the national government and the government of the region of Lombardy and above all the, the industrialists have a great political and moral responsibility for the speed and extent of the spread of COVID-19. At the start of the spread of the virus, when it started to circulate, um, they did not want to act. They should have created red zones in most hard affected areas in the north, in Lombardy, and specifically in the Val Seriana, an area of Lombardy which is home to a pretty large concentration of industry. Here, the industrialists were opposed right from the start to the creation of a red zone which would limit the spread of the virus within that area because they were not willing to give up competitiveness and profit. So we knew all along, but it's made it clear in the eyes of all that for them profit comes before public health. COVID has shown many, many things. For example, it has shown how damaging the destruction of public health is. This was carried out by numerous governments over the course of decades. It has been progressively dismantled. It started with the um, cuts with the closure of local hospitals, with the destruction of regional and um, local services, the, the um, loss of at-home care and the concentration of services in mega hospitals which are unable to provide preventive care which just repair the damage. And, and the, is, is they can only do this insufficiently as well. As we've seen with the dramatic cuts to intensive care beds which has led to a um, huge increase in deaths in COVID. Death toll is much higher than it would have been because of this. We need a system which does not just cure but um, prevents illnesses and that has been dismantled. In 1978 the country was at the forefront of public health. Um, 
since then, everyone has spoken about improving health, the government oppositions, even the industrialists, but so far nothing has been done, nothing has been lined up for creating a health system worthy of this name. So this will be a subject the eco-socialist left and the class orientated left in Italy will be fighting and these cuts, this destruction is not the work of the Holy Spirit but instead has been the result of targeted cuts, deliberate cuts and is come now in the context of an economic crisis which is hitting the country extremely hard it has not stopped since 2008 and now we have covid on top of this this crisis has led to a huge unemployment rate rate of 11 percent before covid but there are also many people who are poorly paid who are living precarious situations particularly among the young who do not appear in these statistics and covid is now creating a recession but has not really created it it's just continuing ten trends and worsening trends which have already and existed which were already underway. The most conservative estimates of the international institutions and the Bank of Italy um, predict that Italy will lose between 8 and 12 percent of its GDP this year. This means that unemployment will rise to well over 15 percent, maybe even to 20 and this will cause a dramatic suffering in the population of the society because the recovery is not just around the corner as um, the, uh, has been suggested in dominating classes, the international institutions and the government have gone on about this but the reality is that we are facing years of serious crisis ahead of us and this will have an impact on the future of the country because the priority of the government of the entrepreneurs and of the international institutions is um, to promote and develop the measures to help capital and large and medium sized companies and this is incompatible with social needs it's enough just to think about the task force set up by the government under the leadership of the ex Vodafone boss Colau, which created a has created a recovery plan, which, to put it mildly, is a disaster. It's a list of companies' wishes. It's a wish list of companies. And it will promote further privatisation as well as reform the health system. It will manage the workforce and mean even further losses of rights. This is something we're particularly concerned about because it comes in a context in which the environment, which is often cited as being um, our pride and joy, is just a fig leaf. No one is interested in seriously dealing with the environmental devastation and way. In fact, it's hardly ever spoken about. They just parrot Green New Deal, Green New Deal, but without implementing any instruments should be concrete and which would tackle the climate crisis and also the destruction of ecosystems which is closely linked to SARS COVID uh, so, so with COVID and the future holds further dismantlement of welfare in Italy and lower salaries 
and more precariousness. In Italy, there is a crisis which is um, affecting parts of the lower middle class, which has been impoverished. In this exceptional circumstance, they are creating the uh, ability to mobilise independently and, and they are moving to the right. The League and the Bras of Italy, the largest parties on the Italian right, continue to have uh, strong support. It is particularly given the government is not capable of dealing with urgent social problems. This is dangerous because when the working classes and the masses are broken, we don't have much alternative. We don't have mass mobilisation which can uh, um, offer an alternative to the government and to the proposals made by the um, impoverished low middle classes, the industrialists and the government which are creating an agenda in the interest of the capital. We need a, an opposition from the workers from mass mobilisation which can change the power balance and implement a real alternative agenda which must put public health and the end of privatisation first because one of the most sectors which is most important for mass mobilisation is the renationalisation of public goods that's at the forefront of the fight against um, global capital and that's a key part of our creating a really um, ecological alternative which will stand up to um, the demands of c capital and will offer a real ecological um, way out of this crisis. We need to strengthen the welfare state in a company in a country like Italy where unemployment is exploding. We need to give people income who need it. We need a publicly run public works program which will also take into account environmental needs and give millions of people useful work. It means building the political capacity and the program which are needed to meet the needs of these challenges. In Italy we are struggling but we are doing our best, we're very committed to create a class orientated left which will deal with these strategic challenges and throw a spanner in the works of capital we have thought up a campaign together with other organisations for renationalisation of the health system and the creation of a new health system which would be pre preventive and not just cure illnesses. We need a health system which is in line with the needs to protect, preserve ecosystems and is closely aligned to them as the virus has shown that this is particularly important. These things may seem fairly trivial but they are very important. We need to unite the different classes, the left, anti-capitalist and ecological left movements to create concrete campaigns which will speak to millions of people. What we're trying to do is this, we'll do this over the next few months, but we think that building this um, grouping at European level, at least at European level, is essential. That's why I particularly appreciate meetings like this. They allow us to create elements of our programme and campaigns which give us the opportunity to speak to millions of people and give us a political and strategic structure which will allow us to deal with problems which will allow us to offer a, an alternative 
which is anti-capitalist and um, ecological and it will be increasingly needed and given the crisis will be um, increasingly bad. Thank you for listening.